When I was asked to make this program about British cinema in something called British Film Year, I hesitated. As a filmmaker, I wouldn't be objective. Also, I don't think television is a medium for thought. People remember what you look like on TV. They never remember anything you say. Then I started reading about British Film Year in their own publication, and I changed my mind. In his introduction, Richard Attenborough claims that those involved represent every segment of our industry. Yet I can find no film director connected with it except himself and Wolf Riller on the Education and Information Committee, and no other creative artist except Joanna Lumley, actress, on the National Events Committee. The most specific aim of the year is, or was, to create a positive upturn of at least 4% in admission figures. Not a very inspiring ambition. But British Film Year was not only dedicated to drumming up business for rank and EMI, it was also to assure British filmmakers that commercial success is not vulgar that they shouldn't feel embarrassed to make successful, accessible films. These are the words of David Putnam, the most voluble member of British Film Year's steering committee. As every schoolboy knows, David Putnam is Britain's most successful film producer. He has identified himself with the British film revival of the 80s, and the proof of this revival is, apparently, the success of our films with the Americans. As Sir Richard writes in his introduction, at the four most recent American award ceremonies, followed, it is estimated, by one billion television viewers around the world, British films have been accorded an amazing total of 17 Oscars. <laughs> I'd like to finish with a word of warning. You may have started something. The British have come. Well, the British came, but their first-class airfares were paid for in dollars. Is it possible to say that there is an authentic British film industry? So David Putnam was asked in an interview with, of all magazines, Marxism Today. His answer was unequivocal, no. Film, for good or ill, is an American medium. There has never been an indigenous film industry in the way that there's been an Italian, French, or American film industry. The film industry, said David Putnam, in its English language form, is inherently American. This is rubbish. English language cinema is not inherently American. Of course, there is a British film tradition. In fact, there have been several. One of them is the subject of this program. I'll start with a quotation. This is from a documentary made in 1939 about the ways working-class people in the north of England spent their spare time.
Spare time was the work of Humphrey Jennings, the most individual of documentary directors. Documentary cinema was a tradition peculiarly British. I'm not talking about propaganda or film journalism or brilliant programs about animals or culture. I mean making films out of contemporary reality. And it's not surprising that when a group of young filmmakers got together 30 years ago, they found that Jennings was the predecessor they admired most and realism was the tradition they inherited. This sporting life was made in 1961, 22 years after spare time. And here's the opening of another British film of that time. This was the story of the passage to manhood of a working class lad, not unemployed as he probably would be today, but almost equally the victim of his situation. Bloody five. Another few more, and that's a lot for a Friday. Fourteen pounds, three and tuppence for a thousand of these a day. No wonder I've always got a bad back. Saturday night and Sunday morning was scripted by Alan Silito from his novel of 1958. But it also derived from the documentary work which a group of young filmmakers had started producing in the mid 50s. The directors were Carol Rice, Tony Richardson, and myself, with Walter Lasserly as cameraman and John Fletcher on camera and sound. We called ourselves Free Cinema. We weren't paid to make our films. They cost practically nothing. They weren't bland advertisements for the British way of life. They were rough-edged and unpolished. My first Free Cinema film was shot at Dreamland in Margate. The first free cinema films were shown at the National Film Theatre in London 30 years ago, in 1956. 1956 was an extraordinary year. The end of World War II had been followed in Britain at any rate by a sort of freeze, a paralysis of exhaustion. The freeze lasted for 10 years. In 1956, the tragedies of Suez and Hungary shattered the fantasies of imperialists and communists and created the hope of a true social democratic new left. And sympathetically, at home, the cultural scene showed extraordinary changes. From the north of England, a whole new generation of writers began to make their mark. Alan Silito from Nottingham, Sheila Delaney from Salford, Willis Hall from Leeds, John Arden from Barnsley. David Storey was from Wakefield, so were John Brain, Stan Barstow, David Mercer. And in London, Tony Richardson from Bradford 
was George Devine's associate at the Royal Court Theatre and making history with a play turned down by every management in London, John Osborne's Look Back in Anger. In the conformist climate of post-war Britain, dissenting voices began to make themselves heard. Journalists called them angry young men. Not that anger was exactly the inspiration of free cinema. We just wanted to make films, but also to release the British cinema from its straitjacket of middle-class respectability. By today's standards, of course, Tony Richardson and Carol Rice weren't doing anything remarkable when they followed their working-class boys and girls into Chris Barber's jazz club at Wood Green. But in 1956, they were taking British cinema into unexplored territory. The third film in that first free cinema program was not a documentary, nor was it directed by one of our group. Lorenzo Mazzetti had come to London from Rome to study art. The British Film Institute gave her a grant to film a tale of two deaf mutes in the East End. We sort of adopted Lorenza and helped her to finish her film. Like us, she believed in the poetry of the everyday. It's easy to understand now why British filmmakers of the 50s were dismissive of free cinema, even antagonistic. There wasn't much content in their work, but they prided themselves on making films very well about nothing, rather like the young makers of pop videos today. We weren't interested in technique, except as a means of expression. What we wanted to do was to get ordinary, uncelebrated life on the screen a concert party given by Miner's children in a Yorkshire village.
these films came from outside our group. One of them arrived in a brown paper parcel from a spare time unit of young technicians at Granada. It was directed by Mike Grigsby, who since made many fine documentaries for ITV. And it was about engine men in a Manchester depot in the last days of steam. Despite the comfort of the diesel, uh, the engine driver himself is going to sit down in his chair at home and say, well, I've lost a good pal. There's all sorts of peculiarities about a steam engine which I don't think to find in a diesel. We have to coax a steam locomotive. We have to try and get the best out of a steam locomotive by uh, different methods of handling. Then a diesel you just sit there and just get square thumbs to pressing buttons. It's only pushing buttons and pulling levers. I think the pride of the railway is going with the steam locomotive. If I know railwaymen, as I do know railwaymen, they can't lose their pride. Uh, as railwaymen, uh, we are out to uh, give the best service possible to the public. Modernisation will disturb a lot of us. That is inevitable. But the steam job is going out. Refuge England was the first film of Robert Vash, who went on to become the leading documentarist of the BBC. It showed London through the eyes of a refugee from Russian-dominated Budapest. I want to tell you about my first day in London. I can still remember clearly what I saw and felt on that day when I arrived from the camp. This is it, what they call London. Well, good morning then. To them, it was a day just like all the others. Business as usual, hours nine to five. But not for me. I was excited and afraid. I knew I have to get used to all these people and things. From now on, they will be parts of my life. I observed them as a child, discovering a new world for myself. What do they look like? Thank you. Next one behind. Two more directors launched by Free Cinema were Alan Tanner and Claude Goretta, now leading filmmakers in Switzerland. They'd come to London hoping to get into movies. They ended up behind the brush counter at Selfridges. We got them a grant from the Film Institute, and the result was a picture of evening in Piccadilly Circus in the 1950s. Are you watching on your left? Six and six. All parts two in. Six and six and nine, six two in. Tune in all parts. Chris, what else could I do? Marry me. I love you, Maria. 
Chris. I love you very much. A big change came when Carol Rice became films officer for the Ford Motor Company and persuaded them to sponsor a series of films completely without advertising. We call this series, Look at Britain. Carol asked me to direct the first of these, and I chose the market at Covent Garden. Every day except Christmas was supposed to be another 20-minute picture, but it came out twice that length. Ford wouldn't increase its £4,000 budget, but Leon Claw, who was producing with Carol, agreed to forego his profit. We were on 35mm now, but we still couldn't synchronise dialogue, so we used voices impressionistically, like music. Small white and a small bronze, that's what we better put that 36 Sussex on, I think. Well, I think a 30 Supreme favourite. People come to the market from the big stores and little shops and barrows. Some of them want cut flowers and some of them plants still growing. They want to be sure they're fresh with plenty of life in them. And they want them out and away and into the shops by nine. Don't get a touch up, please. Right, right with you. Right. One by 36 A to Stevens. One by 42 Loveliness. One by 48 Sussex Pink. And one by 30. Years ago, all the porters in the flower market were women. Now there's only one of them left. Alice has been on the job for 35 years, and when she goes, that's the end of it. When Carol Rice came to make his look at Britain, techniques of sound recording had come on so rapidly that he was able to get much nearer to the boys and girls at the Kennington Youth Club he chose as his subject. Yeah, well, then we're all back together again, and I'm going to ask you whether you feel that a girl ought to be treated differently to a bloke with regards money when they're young. Oh, well, no, I'll give them enough. Give them so enough. Yeah, but what about the first and second pitches, Beryl? Oh, well, I think it's only How do you feel about that business of the girl sort of being paid for all this? Brooke, I admire my everyone. I'd say that, I'd say to my girl, I'd say that now. I'd say, OK, if you want to go dancing, you pay. But if I want to go have pictures, I'd pay like that. Hey, well, yes. Like this Sunday, she wanted to go dancing, not me. She didn't have no money, so we didn't go. <laughs> we went to pictures. Well, put on the agony, put on the style. That's what all the young folk are doing all the while. And as I look around me, I sometimes have to smile. Seeing all the young folk putting on. An unobtrusive, precise camera style, a respect for people as individuals, as well as members of a class or an industry. These were the characteristics of free cinema. Our films were humanist, not sentimental. You could feel the inevitable thrust towards drama, towards the feature film. Hey, Ma! He's out this. No, he's oh, out. He's not. He's out. He's out. Tommy Steele. Hey, I look at Tommy Steele. He's out. Listen, he's out. Oh, shit! Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Mr. Steele. The most glamorous first night for a long time drew celebrities by the hundreds. 
the managing director of Associated British, Mr. C.J. Latter, with his wife, brought their little granddaughters who had a part to play later on. Her Royal Highness drew every eye, radiant as ever, cheered outside and expectantly awaited in the foyer. The princess graciously accepted a bouquet from Mr. Latter's seven-year-old twin granddaughters, Pam and Peg Boyd Gibbons. The feature industry was sublimely indifferent to free cinema. British films remained stuck in complacency, stagnation. Even Ealing Studios, always more genteel than dynamic, had gone out of business. War stories like The Dam Busters, Yangtze Incident, The Cruel Sea, preserved the deathless tradition of the stiff upper-class lip. The facetious Doctor series furnished comedy with carry-on for down-market situations. British cinema was essentially middle-class, essentially southern. The north was where Gracie Fields and George Formby came from. After the Lambeth Boys, the Ford Motor Company pulled the plug on us. They'd won two international Grand Prix with Every Day and the Lambeth Boys, but films didn't carry the prestige of opera or sport. And at about the same time, the National Film Theatre told us we could no longer count on them to present free cinema shows. They were too political. So Carol retreated to advertising the new line in Ford cars, and I joined Tony Richardson to direct plays at the Royal Court. And actually, it was from the court the breakthrough came. After the success of Look Back in Anger, Tony and John Osborne formed their own movie company, Woodfall. They filmed Look Back, and they followed it with The Entertainer. Then, somehow, Woodfall found the finance for Carol Rice to film Saturday Night and Sunday Morning, and a new kind of hero took possession of the screen. Albert Finney's Arthur Seaton was light years away from the respectful, good-humoured English worker of tradition, and from the well-spoken conformist who had till then typified the English star. Here was a sexuality, an unsentimental ruthlessness that jolted British cinema towards a new honesty. Don't let the bastards grind you down, that's one thing I've learned. Jack's one that ain't learned it. He wants to get on. Yes, Mr. Robbo. No, Mr. Robbo. I'll do it as soon as I can, Mr. Robbo. And look where they got Robbo. A fat gut and lots of worry. I'd like to see anybody try to grind me down. That'd be the day. What I'm out for is a good time. All the rest is propaganda. But it was the dramatic strength of Saturday Night and Sunday Morning, the truth of its writing, its acting by Albert Finney and Rachel Roberts, that was to open up a whole new area of experience to British filmmakers. What's up with you? Oh, stop it. You make too much fuss. What's the matter with you tonight? I'll tell you what's the matter with me, Arthur. I'm pregnant. Good and proper this time. And it's your fault. Oh, well, it's better be my fault, isn't it? Of course it is. You never say K, you just don't bother. I was said this would happen one day. What a wonderful Friday night. How do you know? You never believe anything, do you? Because you've got to see the kid before you believe me. Well, I'm 12 days late. That means it's dead sure. <laughs> Nothing's dead sure. This is. All right, all oh, right. Still. I don't know, it's mine. Don't you want to take the blame now, then? Are you backing out or blame. something? There's no blame on me. I just want to know whether it's mine or not. It's not bad yes, to be, is it? Yes, yes, it's yours right enough. I'm done out like that with Jack for a couple of months or more. And I don't want to have it. I can tell you that now. Well, have you tried out? Took out, I mean. Yeah, some pills. It didn't work. Thirty bob that cost me two gone right down the drain. God almighty. He won't help you. Now, look, you've got to do something, you know. Well, don't you want to have the kid? I suppose you'd like me to have a kid by you. Well, another one won't make much difference, will it? Don't talk so daft. What do you think having a kid means? You're doped and sick for nine months, your clothes don't fit, nobody look at you. One day you're yelling out and you've got a kid. Mm, all that's not too bad. But you've got to look after it for the rest of its life. You want to try it sometime. <laughs> 
With the success of Saturday night and Sunday morning, the walls came tumbling down. Movie stories could now be written from common experience. New directors were suddenly acceptable, so were new actors. Tony Richardson filmed another Alan Silito story, The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner, and was able to cast two unknowns as the rival runners. The young James Fox confronted the young Tom Courtney. Oh, uh, it's, uh, good luck to you. You're gonna need it, mate. You haven't got a chance. Come along, lads. Come Here on. we go. After you. Uh, no, uh, after you. OK, come on. Another northern story filmed by Tony Richardson was Sheila Delaney's Taste of Honey. This was shot in Salford, completely on location, regarded then as a dangerous innovation, and gave Rita Tushingham her first film part. Oh, good God, I don't feel like... Hey, 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 hey. What does the little lady want? An engagement ring? Well, I always accept the old diamond ring, the pleasure, you know. <coughs> Who's that? It's my daughter. Hello, then. What's this one called? Oh, go on, go to bed, go on. Are you coming? Not yet. Then I'll wait for you. <coughs> she ought to be in bed. I know she should. Shall I retire while you kiss her good night? I'll kiss you good night, young lady, and it really will be good night. Hey! Middle class critics, and of course all critics are middle class by definition, didn't really like these films. Kitchen sink was the standard dismissive epithet, with the implication that they all looked the same, like wogs or Chinamen. But they weren't all the same. Their directors were different, and so were their writers. Sheila Delaney was not like Alan Silito, and David Storey was not like either of them. His This Sporting Life, which was my first feature film, told the impossible story of a fatally mismatched couple, with the superb Rachel Roberts again, and a still unspoiled Richard Harris. Thank God. There's one part of my life you've never touched. You mean Eric? He's the one thing you can't touch. And he's the one really good thing. Well, let's all get down on our knees and pray for the good soul of Eric Hammers. The father of this house! Oh, he must hurt you. Well, come on, come on, then. Let's put his bloody boots right back in the house! You don't know. You don't know. You don't know. It's not that I've seen a crazy thing in my life, that's it. I know enough about you to keep you in a rubber room for the rest of your life. You know nothing about Eric, or me. You know nothing about Eric. I know he put the file through his guts. But you made him so happy, he went and killed himself. You want to kill me? Eric is dead. You understand that? Eric is dead. You make me feel I'm nothing. I want you. No, you want to crush me, but I won't let you. I'm the one thing you can't have like everything else. I want you. I want you to go. I need you. I want you to go. I want you to go. I want you to go. This sporting life was too harsh to be accepted as entertainment by the British public. The rank organisation disowned it. Their managing director, Sir John Davis, promised that there would be no more such unreal, squalid stories, and that in future the company would concentrate on family entertainment. They've since gone out of the producing business. At the end of the year, the London Evening Standard announced with a smirk that 1963 had been the year the kitchen sink went down the drain. 
Tony Richardson was certainly wise to choose as his next film the lusty comedy of Tom Jones, adapted by John Osborne from Fielding's 18th century classic. This starred Albert Finney again. Everyone was amazed when Tom Jones won the Oscar and made fortunes for all concerned. Ever since those days, critics have, for some reason, written off the free cinema films of the 60s as unimaginative social realism or dreary political propaganda. As you can see, this is untrue. These films were aware of the world around them. They meant something. They were not escapist. When Carol Rice turned David Mercer's suitable case for treatment into Morgan, he made a comedy that expressed the desperation of a man for whom the Marxist god had failed. That's what your dad always used to say. You hang on, you wait and see. It'll all come crashing down, and our Morgan will live to see it. See what, Ma? Oh, Morgan, the revolution. Yeah, I'll take the flowers. You sit down and have a rest. Your dad used to love coming here. You know he wanted to shoot the royal family, abolish marriage, and put everybody who'd been to public school in a chain gang. Yes, he was an idealist, your dad was. Yeah, I remember. I say, read the inscription, Morgan, it's beautiful. You know it, Ma. Now, read it. Philosophers have tried to understand the world. Our problem, however, is to change it. That's very true, Morgan. <clears throat> No offence in that. The most ambitious picture in this tradition was Tony Richardson's Charge of the Light Brigade, a far cry from the old Hollywood fantasia with Errol Flynn. Tony's film was lavish and spectacular, but behind the stirring disaster of legend was the absurdity and waste of the enduring English system of class. <laughs> Hey, Henry. 
Henry, skirmishers. Will be, dear, will be. Coming on like a soldier. <laughs> skirmishers indeed. That is the life of the game. By the mid-60s, free cinema as a recognisable movement was over. The cinema, you know, always reflects, sometimes anticipates, the mood of society. And in 60s Britain, the ideal of freedom was soon overtaken by the principles of survival. The dream of the new left faded, and we moved on towards the opportunistic 70s. In 1965, Dick Lester made The Knack, a Woodfall film, ironically enough. And suddenly, we were in the era of swinging London. Relevance was out. Carol Rice made Isadora, which took him on a different path. His next two pictures were made in Hollywood. Tony Richardson left for California after the charge of the Light Brigade. For the last 20 years, he's lived in Los Angeles. In 1967, I was sent a script called Crusaders which two young writers, David Sherwin and John Howlett, had written about their time at public school. David and I worked together to make it into a film we called If. Strangely enough, If coincided with student uprisings all over Europe. Free cinema became the voice of dissent, even of warning. If we look around us at the world today, what do we see? We see bloodshed, confusion, decay. But England, our England doesn't change so easily. And back here in college today, I feel, and it makes me jolly proud, that there is still a tradition here which has not changed, and by God, it isn't going to change. It's up to all of you chaps to give the world a lead. It is Britain's tradition that you have learned here. Self-reliance, service, self-sacrifice. My God, we're on fire. Now, don't panic. Don't panic, women first! Don't shout! Don't panic! Don't panic! Oh my God! Come on, stand up! Stand up! Stand up for college! In the 70s, it became clear that Britain had decided against change. And on no level was it interested in the idea of a radical cinema. Free cinema was moral as well as radical. The generations that have followed are not interested in moral judgments. The intellectuals opted for a cinema of aesthetic escapism. Movies are about movies. As Orwell said, England is the only great country whose intellectuals are ashamed of their own nationality. Ours preferred the cinema of France and Germany. It became generally accepted that the only necessary change in society was in the level of your salary or the size of your wage packet. It was symptomatic that the British filmmakers of the 70s should turn increasingly to America for stimulus and for money. They had no desire to look at Britain. It was also inevitable but when David Sherwin, Malcolm McDowell and I made another film, we would show revolutionary Mick Travis, now the victim of his sentimental belief in mankind, mocked by the lyric irony of Alan Price. Ah, join the army! Listen to me! Brothers! Brothers! We ain't <laughs> Listen to me! 
You're men. You must realize it. Men. Mankind. Brothers, it's the only truth. Only man exists. Man. Listen to it. What a marvelous word. Is it a marvelous word? It's fantastic. We must respect it. We must respect each other. Not charity, not pity, but dignity, respect. I know, I swear it. We must love one another. Love! <laughs> changes and no one knows what's going on and everybody changes places but the world still carries on love must always change to sorrow and everyone must play the game it's here today and gone tomorrow But the world goes on the same British Film Year defines success in terms of box office, which means acceptance of American domination, salvation through Spielberg, Clint Eastwood and Sylvester Stallone, the myth of the Oscar, it's a captured cinema. Free cinema proved that there is or could be an indigenous film tradition, if we wanted one, that British films can and should be made with British actors rather than American stars, and that a radical spirit is more creative than a conformist one. No art is worth much which doesn't aim to change the world. Of course, no artist can be judged by his success or failure to change the world, since none of us ever succeed. We can only hope to change or to influence like-minded spirits or hearts by telling the truth. The British Film Year Manual faults my last film for lacking clearness of eye. I can only say that I'm happy to have held up to our country in the 80s, still ruinously divided, ever more shadowed by the threat of violence, the mirror of Britannia Hospital. The last free cinema film, Time Will Tell. Things are getting out of control. There's only one thing to do. Cut the tour. And the lunch. And advance the ceremony. Biles, check the red carpet and the orchestra. Alert, Miller. Yes, sir. Here's all this stuff I've
Fuck the face!